Welcome to Virtual Triangle SciTech Expo. My name is Nancy and I'm going to be uh, your host for this program. And with me is John Gerwin. Um, he is actually going to talk about sustainable coffee and sustaining livelihood and also about the wildlife in Nicaragua. So um, because we do have some people that are joining us from YouTube and from Zoom, I'm going to give you a quick, quick uh, Zoom tutorial. So uh, it kind of like optimizes your viewing uh, experience. And so the first thing I want to um, show you is that, oops, I'm sorry. Here we go. Um, Caption is actually available uh, in YouTube and uh, in uh, Zoom, but for Zoom, you actually have to click on that closed caption button at the bottom of your screen, and then you have to select show subtitles. And if you are in gallery view, you can see that the guest and the speaker boxes are obscuring your slides. So what you want to do is you actually want to click on the speaker view. And if you do that, then you can actually look at uh, optimize um, uh, view options, and then you click on side by side mode, and that way your speaker box is going to be next to your slides show, and you can make your speaker box bigger or smaller just by moving that slide bar either to the left or to the right. And that last but not least, we do want to hear from you, so we do have some chat options in YouTube and in Zoom as well. And so if you have any questions for John, you can type that in uh, the chat. Also, if you have any comments, please feel free to put that in the chat as well. We just want you to uh, be mindful and respectful. Just, you know, be good uh, digital citizens. And of that, actually, we want to get that chat going. And we have a question for you. We want to know how many cups of coffee uh, do you drink a day and do you have a favorite brand? And so with that, um, I'm going to now introduce our speaker, uh, John Gerwin. John is a research curator and educator of ornithology at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. And he has worked here for over 32 years. And in his spare time, he immerses himself in nature and studies about all kinds of things like fungi, butterflies, dragonflies, bumblebees, reptiles and amphibians, but also coffee. So, and that's what he's going to talk about today. So, John, welcome. How are you doing? All right. Great. Thanks for the invite. Thanks, everybody, for joining us on this lovely afternoon. I'm working on my fifth or sixth cup of coffee right now. I, I will. still have to have my <laughs> first <laughs> It's a great way to spend uh, my birthday. Today is my birthday, so. Happy birthday. Happy. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and share the screen. When I do, it's going to come up in a funny sort of pattern. I have to do a couple of things here to get it to show what I want to show, which is to go into full screen mode here. There you go. You should be able to see it now. So yeah, I've got a kind of a lot to say about <clears throat> sustainable coffee and how uh, we work that into uh, issues of, of both wildlife and uh, people conservation in Nicaragua because the, the topic of sustainable coffee is a little bit complex. So I'm gonna get right into it. Uh, just real quickly, the bird unit, there's a couple of us that work full time here, myself and Brian O'Shea, and we do typical museum stuff, which is the, the dead bird stuff. We have a collection of over 20,000 specimens that are used by other researchers and artists and educators. And we do field work, so we do live bird work out there, and we do a lot of education and a lot of training with us, both students and adults to, to help us do some of the work that we do. So as I said, coffee, is a, it's kind of complex. So I, I, I phrase it as if people jump to confusion because there is a lot of confusion around a lot of the labeling that goes on in coffee, and we're going to go through some of that. I just want to mention that with coffee or with uh, cocoa, with chocolate, they have very similar issues. And I'm not going to cover it here because that would be a whole nother talk, but I encourage you to go online and read about some of the challenges of producing chocolate. And then I will weave in a little bit of work we've done on one particular migratory bird, the golden winged warbler. And at the end, we'll look at some pretty pictures of some of the wildlife that we see on these farms. Um, I've been going to Nicaragua since 2005. I had to stop in 2019, but during that time, 
I made uh, 14 trips. Uh, most of these were as part of eco tours with college students as well as research trips. So they were anywhere from three to six week adventures. Let me get us on the same map. Here's Nicaragua in Central America. To the north is Honduras. To the south is Costa Rica. Over here, the Caribbean side and over here, the Pacific Ocean. So if we zoom in, this up here, this northwest section, this is where the mountains are. So that's where the coffee is grown most of the time. Most of the time I spend is here in the province of Matagalpa, not far from the city of Matagalpa. And I've done a little bit of work in Hinotega. There's a little mountain range down here southwest of Managua. This is the capital. So this is where we fly in. And there's some coffee grown down here as well. This is the Caribbean or the, the Caribbean slope. This is the lowland side over here on the west. The beaches uh, are not overly developed yet. But, and there are some sea turtle nesting sites over here. Some are protected, some are not. Um, but Nicaragua is a pretty large landmass, as you can see. So there's actually a lot of potential habitat. Uh, I'm a bird guy, so I couldn't help but mention that this bird, the turquoise browed motmot, is the national bird of Nicaragua. A beautiful bird. The sexes are alike. So I can't tell you if this is a male or female. In Spanish, it's called a guarda barranco, which means the guardian of the bank. It is not a financial bank, but a mud bank. This bird nests in burrows. It is uh, along streams and, and small rivers and, and the ravines. It's related to, they're related to woodpecker and kingfisher. But the motmots are a new world tropical group of birds that have these racket tails. Different species all have these racket tails at the tip of their tail. <laughs> So here are the mountains. Here's a topo map, <clears throat> and I've circled the area that where I primarily have worked, and this is the area then where most of the, uh, where the coffee in Nicaragua has grown most of it. Here's that other little mountain range south of Managua. I got started when I was invited by a couple of colleagues who used to work at the museum to to lead some eco tours there, and and I'll ex I'll explain more of that as we go go along. Um, but when I got there. Uh, I met folks that I wanted to train, and they were looking for some help to train the locals. I speak Spanish, so I could teach English, and I could train them on their um, on their birds and wildlife and what it was that tourists would want to see. I've done this in other countries. I've worked in Peru and Ecuador and uh, Bolivia to do similar things. <clears throat> so this drew, grew into a tropical ecology class with NC State Guilford College, and then the research on the one bird the golden wing warbler I'll talk about. And then we took all this stuff together and we used it to consult with the landowners for habitat management and, and ecotourism. And again, these, are, um, <clears throat> these were coffee farms that, <clears throat> that also had built lodges on the property to, to invite tourists to come down and invite researchers. So I'm going to cover sustainable coffee, but it's kind of woven into all these different things. So how, how can we weave in these other topics and be sustainable. And so I'm going to touch on these different things throughout the talk. So one of the problems that happened in 2018 in Nicaragua, there was a big uprising. There was, a, there was some real political turmoil and the government's reaction was pretty violent. And between April and July of 2018, they killed over 300 citizens. And then that, so that shut down the tourism. So although I went in 2019, I was, you know, one of the few outsider there at that point, people just stopped going. And so that the whole industry has kind of collapsed, which is a real shame. They're still doing coffee, but they're just not doing tourism now. So we hear a lot about, you may have heard a lot about the different kinds of coffee, all the different ways of labeling coffee. And so what is it? Why do we care? This is some coffee growing in the shade of this forest, and, but there's different ways to be shade and there's different ways to be all these labels. So we're going to go through that. That's makes it a little complicated. <clears throat> in general, coffee is growing in a humid or what we call a cloud forest because typically in these, in these habitats, at night, these, the fog would roll in and it sits over the canopy of the trees and all these plants and animals are adapted to this. This is typically where they get a lot of moisture. And in Nicaragua, that elevation is between around 3,500 and 5,000 feet. As you go further south, closer to the equator, that it, things will, it'll get a little bit higher and higher where you get the this humid fog or cloud force as we call it. But it's home to birds, a lot of wildlife, and coffee. The two places that primarily worked were at Hawar Preserve, which is up in Hinotega province, and then Finca Esperanza Verde is in Matagalpa. And I'll be talking, I'll be telling you some stories about those two places and the coffee production and the wildlife conservation. So to tell you a little bit about coffee, <clears throat> the, the, the main thing, and I think everybody knows this, it's big business. 
And here's some, here's some graphs from a museum in Matagalpa. I, I took a few photos there when I was there in uh, about 2008, soon after this uh, was put up. So who's consuming coffee? Who's drinking all this coffee besides me? Uh, well, the United States is. So a quarter of the coffee is consumed here in the U.S. At least it was in 2007. Other big consumers are Brazil, Germany, Japan, and then you go on through these other countries. Where do they get their coffee from? Where is it being produced? Well, it turns out a lot of it is produced in Vietnam and Brazil. And a lot of people are surprised that Vietnam is such a large producer of coffee. This is, not, this is typically not very good coffee. This is a really inexpensive coffee. Um, it's your low-grade coffee. But that a lot of that coffee is, is what people drink. Uh, Brazil is a mix of both high quality and what I would consider low quality. And, of course, we hear a lot about Colombia. So back in 2007, they were at 15%. And then all these other countries do their part to produce coffee. And a lot of them are producing what we would call the more specialty coffees, the, the higher end. And, and that's what we refer to typically as more sustainable. One of the <clears throat> big, big buzzwords that came out some 20, 25 years ago was, was growing shade coffee. But you know, there's a lot of ways to be shady. So um, people who were growing coffee wanted to get in on it because if you were growing shade coffee, you could, you could ask for a higher price. Uh, bird people were into shade coffee, got it, started getting into shade coffee and were willing to pay more for it. So typically, this is how coffee was grown before anybody had a label for it. Somebody owned a couple acres of land and they went out and planted coffee bushes inside their forest. And it was a family, small family operation. And then they harvested their coffee and sold it. And that was that. But then, uh, you know, some people thought, well, you know, as long as I'm planting coffee, I can plant a few other trees. There might be things I'm interested in for other economic reasons like fruit. I can eat it or sell it, or maybe I can grow some trees for lumber. So the family started adding a little bit more, and then it came and then it grew into something bigger, so more commercial. Now it's more like a farming, tree farming, and adding a lot of trees, which means taking out some of the native trees to put in things that are of commercial interest. And then another way you can do it is you might go into an area and cut all the native trees and replant with a fast-growing local tree, or you might go into a pasture get rid of the cattle and plant a bunch of trees that grow fast, like flowering inga, and then you have shade, and then it's a monoculture. That's, it, that's not so bad, actually. It sounds, it doesn't sound as good. It's not, not as good as, say, a variety of, of trees in a native habitat, but I still think it's better than sun, and there's things like flowering inga that are used, which is actually a pretty interesting tree. A lot of animals like a flowering inga, so if you've got five acres of flowering inga, I think it's still better than just sun coffee. Sun coffee no shade, that's your more your biggest commercial operation, and that's typically with a lot of chemical input, fertilizer, pesticides, and also uh, mechanized uh, machinery, so not as many locals are involved in the work because it's done by machines. And so that's sort of the way it plays out. Here's a, some coffee bushes in flower. And they'll be start, they're flowering now. We're starting to flower now in Nicaragua, and they'll be ready for harvest in uh, November, December. And if we look up close, there's a flower up close. And then when they are pollinated and set fruit, they start off green. There's a variety that will ripen yellow. And then the more typical color that, that we're used to are the red ones. And from this, they get their name that we refer to them as coffee cherries. And it turns out that coffee, we know there's different varieties like a Robusta and Arabica. We hear that a lot. Um, you'll, you know, people like to brag about selling their Arabica coffee. It's, a, it's considered the better coffee. But within these two, you can have these different kinds of coffee. Even just like with wine, you can have different kinds. Within one type of grape, you have different kinds of like subspecies. And so uh, the people who taste wine say that they, they can taste the difference between some of these. And so roasters will buy these different kinds of beans and they will blend them to make their own their special blend. And the variety of coffee can grow, you know, will, can help with how you grow them on your farm. For example, if you have different soils or different microclimates or you have different pathogens, some coffees are more resistant than others. And so you can, you can use it in, in your mix. So how do you get that bean? <clears throat> we're going we're gonna to spend a few minutes talking about getting the bean off the bush and into your cup. The harvesting for really what we call sustainable or higher quality coffee is done by hand. And so these men and women go out with a basket around their waist and they're picking coffee off these bushes. They start about sunrise and they'll go for a day. 
the condition can vary. If the farm is certified, if, if it's a well-certified farm, then the conditions are pretty good. They'll get paid well. They might have, they'll have places to sit in the shade. They'll get, usually get one, maybe two meals provided. And, um, and anyway, they're, and they're just treated well. Otherwise, it can be pretty rough and, and the treatments are not so good. So these folks, when they're doing the sustainable type harvesting, they're going to pick anywhere from 125 to over 200 pounds a day. These baskets hold five or six pounds. So they'll fill up the basket, they'll go empty it, and they'll, and they'll head back out and get some more. Other, other types of picking, and I'm going to explain this in a minute. He's picking very carefully. Other people who are not so careful can pick a lot more coffee, but it, but it damages the bushes. Once it's picked, then again, they, they take your basket and uh, you will sort it. So these uh, women are here sorting out a variety of coffee. They've picked some green and some red. You can actually sell the green coffee. It's just a little lower. This, the green uh, cherries are a little bit lower quality, but they, when they need it, they need it. Um, so historically in Nicaragua, the women were uh, the better pickers. They had a men, the guys told me down there that they just had better dexterity. When I started going and I was asking about it, um, of course, part of the problem was that uh, 40 years ago, there was the revolution, and a lot of men were killed in Nicaragua during the Iran, during the, uh, I mean, the Contra Sandinista uh, uh, battle. And um, so for the longest time, it was mostly women that were allowed to do the work, but they, they just have a better way of focusing on the work and focusing on family support. You know, and some of the challenges then are just what you'd expect on any kind of large agricultural or, or just large worksite operation. Uh, as I said, some are getting low wages, some, there's a labor issue is hard work and how they're treated that these these women and men they'll get paid every day so they're carrying cash and so some other people will try to steal from them at the end of a the day there's sometimes alcoholism this typically is a problem with the men when they start working again and that this is a job that people people move around their own country so they're migrants within their own country this may be the only job these women have harvesting in Nicaragua is typically from late November into mid to late March, and that, that may be the only work they get for the whole year. And so that's, they've got to keep them going to cash. That's the only cash that they might get. And so they move around. They move around in that mountainous region from farm to farm. And uh, those that have been doing it for a while have an established route, and people know them. The, far, the, the owners of the farm know these people, and, you know, they, have, they schedule them. But, um, but it's a big deal. So now they got these beans out there and they're sorting. <clears throat> what goes on? This is what it looks like on the inside of a cherry. It's actually there's actually two beans. So two beans are, are the seed. Those are those are the coffee beans. They get picked, they're washed, um, split apart to get the bean. There's this parchment on the outside, and um, the beans are milled to get rid of that parchment if it if they can be gotten rid of. Sometimes not 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 so well. So they then sort them into different kinds of into different qualities and then they have to be shipped. But that's just glossing over. So we're going to take a, a closer look at this. So again, you saw the women sorting the cherries. Once they're sorted, now there might be a mill. In this case, it's a little wet mill. It used to be operated by hand. The guys down there at Finca Esperanza Verde used to, when I first started going, they crank it by hand. And then some students from Appalachian State University, some engineering students were down. They have an arrangement with the Finca, and they come down and they'd study a situation. And they'd say, okay, how can we help? And one year they said, you know what? We could help by making you a water mill that's run by the stream that flows under the, uh, over the road. And that, that's what they did. They went back home and they designed this and then they brought all the parts back and uh, they had to buy some extra parts when they got to Nicaragua and then they installed it for these guys. So um, this thing is set to crush the cherries just enough to get the pulp off, but not enough that it, it doesn't damage the bean. So the pulp is removed. That can be used in compost. You, you have to use it for compost if you're certified, sustainable. Otherwise, uh, it can be a little bit uh, toxic. And then it's washed. And when the beans are washed, it can be a little bit toxic what comes off. So, uh, so they treat the water as well to be sustainable. There is a new technique to leave some of the mucilage on. And apparently, if you ferment it, you can get a different flavor on the bean. And now it's kind of a new thing. I've, uh, uh, I was just hearing about this in 2019. Honey coffee, uh, leaving the mucilage on for a little bit, like ferment a little bit. But I don't know where that's at right now since, like I said, everything shut down for me in 2019. And it gets sorted again and dried. So here you can end up with these three coffee. This has not been, the parchment still on most of this is a lower quality, but that will be sold to a, you know, a place like Folgers and that'll make a low quality coffee. And then mid quality, and this is your highest quality. Um, so these things get bagged, weighed, weighed at the farm, 
big 100 kilo bags. They got to be transported down to some co-op head or, or uh, get it to the guy who's going to be doing the exporting and working with the people in other countries. Green coffee, which this is considered green coffee, it's unroasted coffee, can last a pretty long time. I've had some that's a year, over a year old and then uh, got it to a roaster and I, I thought it tasted fine, but I'm probably no expert at this, but I, I think it can last a pretty long time before it needs to be roasted. Then it gets imported in a place like the U.S., so it might come to a place like Larry Beans or Counterculture. Then it gets roasted, and finally, it's sold to the consumer. There's a lot of little steps in the way, and all these ways, there's ways to be either sustainable or not sustainable. So in part of my work working with students of all ages, I've had a couple of young ones working with me the last decade, and these two twin sisters are, um, they've been around for about, nine years now with me, and they are half Spanish. Their family, mother's side is from Spain. So they grew up speaking some Spanish, and I needed some help one year. And so in 2017, they were available, taking a gap year out of high school. So I said, come with me and help teach English to some of the women on the farm. And also I had a couple other tasks for them to do, and I'll, I'll show you what those were. But this is a great way to both get them involved in, in this whole endeavor and understand this idea of this international economics as well as wildlife conservation and doing some social service work. But one of the things I had them do was learn how to pick coffee. So the coffee manager taught them how to pick it. And then we waited. I wanted to show them just, you know, what it would mean if they were picking coffee for a day. I just had them do it for an hour. And you can see they're having to pick the right bean and you grab it in your thumb and forefinger and you twist to get it off bean by bean. You cannot rake across this or it damages the bush. So to be sustainable coffee farms, these those men and women that are doing it full time, they have to twist and twist and pull, twist and pull. It's quite laborious. Anyway, at the end of an hour, they each had picked up about, uh, we, we calculated at that, that year what the going rate was on the market for coffee. And then we weighed their, weighed their coffee. So we could, we figured out that they were earning about 10 cents an hour. So if they had worked all day, they would have gotten about a dollar. Uh, most of the Nicaraguans that are experienced will get anywhere from 5 to $7 a day when they're picking coffee, which is pretty good wages because that's a fair, that's a, a higher wage than they would get at a non -cert, much higher than a non-certified farm. But that was a year, that was the year that coffee was selling a little higher. <clears throat> so what are these certifications? You, you know, things started with organic. Most of us know what that is. So that's getting the chemicals out of your out of your chain supply chain not using heavy pesticide and, and herbicides so getting pollution out of that chain and then people were also wanting to get the uh, the pollution so to speak out of how we treat people so those farm pickers were not for the longest time were not getting paid very much so along came an organization to certify that they would get a living wage and that but that meant that all these things have to be uh, certified by a third party, and that means that somebody's got to pay for it. So that's the farmers or the producers. Ultimately, it's passed on to the consumer. There are always issues with these systems, right? There's always people trying to cheat or some people just trying to, you know, get uh, get something for nothing. Anyway, nothing's perfect, but it really moved the needle. It really got people aware of problems going on. And then along came another fair trade group just to try and improve on this, and they have. And then another group came along to say, you know, we can make it even better, incorporate other parameters. Uh, some of the parameters that were not taken into account here were the wildlife or the environmental stuff. And so Rainforest Alliance came up with one that incorporates social things as well as wildlife. Some of the buyers were not thrilled with this because it, was, it meant a higher cost to the coffee and they would have to pay for it and pass it on to the consumer. So they said, you know what, let us, we see what you're saying, let us just do it trust us, we'll buy the coffee and we'll, we'll treat them right, we'll pay the fair wages and all that. And they called it direct trade and that's fine, but once you're out of the system and you're not having a third party certify it, then it is trust, you don't know what they're doing, you really don't know if they're doing the right thing. So it's sort of the fox watching the hen house. Um, but, uh, but, but there are still some who, who say they're doing it the right way and you just have to believe them if they label it direct trade. But that even, even it has some problems with dealing with the market. So um, everybody, at least a lot of people now are trying, trying to do the right thing. And then uh, for the bird people years ago, 30 or so years ago, the bird people at the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center, they, they, the director had been studying birds on coffee farms for years. 
And he saw the difference that it made when you had what he called bird-friendly coffee. And so he developed standards. And so parameters for what it meant to be a bird-friendly coffee and to have this label put on your bag. And when you had this label, you could charge a lot more for the coffee. And that money went back to the farmers to be able to do that. Because what happens when you have 40% shade and you, you let the epiphytes grow on the tree, the ferns, the mosses, the orchids, and you have a certain height, you generally are growing, going to grow less coffee. It's not going to produce as much coffee. So that's a, it's a different quantity. The quality is really good, but the quantity is less. So to make up for the lower qu quantity, you charge a higher price, <clears throat> and people are willing to pay for it. Um, Birds and Beans is one company that sells this coffee and has for years, and there's another. I forget the, other, the name of the other company that does. They're online. And uh, over time... Uh, you know, growers just either couldn't do this, they just couldn't make the parameter, they just didn't want to. So that's why we had these other programs that filled a gap. And so Birds and Beans also started to fill out their inventory of what they offer, the sale with other things that are incorporating organic and fair trade and other things. So, you know, again, it's moving the dot, the needle, moving the dial to get people to do things that are more wildlife friendly and more uh, people friendly, community friendly. So here's some coffee growing under the shade of farm at Selva Negra. Here is Finca Esperanza Verde. You can see it's pretty similar. But you can also see there's a, there's, you know, a fair amount of light, and you wonder, is this really shady? And, uh, and it is uh, when you're there. This canopy is extending over your head, and there's a lot of animals that will live in this type of, of canopy. Some farms have more shade. Some have a little less. What are the other things they have to deal with? <clears throat> when you are organic, and most of the sustainable farms are organic, you have pesticide, pests always trying to get in, and one of them is this fungus, the roya. It's a rust. And if you're managing, uh, you can keep up with it usually, and some of the strains of coffee are resistant, but not all. But you can, if you farm it just right. But in 2013, there was a huge outbreak, and people couldn't keep up. And it was the worst since 1976, and it, it devastated a lot of farms. It killed a lot of the coffee, and there was a lot of high unemployment. And then, of course, the coffee price went up. Uh, that, that's just one of the things that farmers have to deal with. <clears throat> and I'll talk about this in a minute because it had a real impact on Esperanza Verde. So these are the things, the, a lot of things we're trying to think about. What is sustainable? Um, so it's complex. Uh, there's the environmental stuff I've talked about, and that's actually gone now evolved into the roasters are keeping track of their energy use during roasting and sales for example larry's beans and joe van gogh here locally drive electric vehicles because they're trying to close the loop that whole loop of sustainable it's not just what goes on on the farm and then but the social aspects of the farming so i've talked about those the economic the fair living wages and support to communities i'm going to talk about that here next um and the market forces, it's a, this is very difficult for the farmers, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit of that. And then the ecotourism that I've been involved with. And, you know, what's our carbon footprint when we're, when we're flying to Nicaragua? And I don't know. I haven't calculated it yet, but it's things we, we want to think about. And just how involved do we make our, our clients when we, when we do the trips? So here are the two farms I've worked at. And just to tell you some stories and some of the challenges they've gone through and how things got started and what were their ideas of sustainable so I think Esperanza Verde was started by Lana and Richard Hargrader, who live in Durham, and they worked with their church group to buy an abandoned farm about 20 years ago, and they rehabbed it, and they called it Finca uh, Green Hope Farm, to grow coffee and to provide services to the people in the community. And after about 12 years of doing that, they sold it, and Vivian and Andrew wanted to get in on that sort of thing, and so they bought the, the farm, and they continued on the work. Uh, just kind of kicked it up a notch. George and Lily are up at Haguar, up in Hinotega. Lily grew up in the region, and it's her family's farm. She's a political scientist, but she got into wildlife and birds th some 30 years ago. She's now the Nicaragua expert on birds. Just you know, taught herself and went to meetings and went to all you know outdoor things, and, and really just did the hard work on her own. And now she's—I'll uh, show you the cover of her book that she just recently published. Um, and this is George, her husband, and he moved over there from Switzerland. He's an agronomist, but he moved over about 50 years ago. So they run the farm and they run uh, the reserve, the wildlife reserve. What Lon and Richard wanted to do was help the people as much as they could, as well as rehabbing the farm. And so what they, what they did is form something called Sister Communities of San Ramon with their church group in Durham. And 
between the tourism and the coffee and some other fundraising, they were able to build a, over a dozen schools in the region. And the reason they did this is that uh, if there's not a school nearby where the kids can walk to in about 30 to 45 minutes, they won't go. And the government wasn't building schools, but they said, if you build a school, we'll provide the teachers. So Lon and Richard made this arrangement that uh, uh, their sister community made the arrangement with the government to provide a teacher for every school they built. And they, and they did that. This is the school that's on the farm at Finca Esperanza Verde. So this is a little, they're called La Chispa. They also got money to replant thousands of trees. This abandoned coffee farm was a lot of pasture when they bought it, and now it's a lot of forest. And they used the money to pay the locals. So that was jobs for the locals to replant. So again, helping, so helping the people, helping the wildlife, these things go together. And this, was, this is a, a message that a lot of groups are now uh, using. This is the way that we're working toward things. It's not just, they're not separate things. Um, Yelda Valenzuela is a local from in Matagalpa that, that Lana and Richard hired for the first like eight years. She ran the farm when they weren't there. And she especially ran the tourism and she just did a great job at the hospitality. She learned so much. She ended up getting garnering several international awards for the way they were running the, the lodge and the coffee farm and doing those uh, social services in the community. It was quite the thing. And then she was invited to go up to another farm in Hinotega province and help start a similar thing. And she, she was working with uh, this gal from England doing some social work stuff and some lodge stuff. And she asked me to come down and help train these young people that, that were in the school to learn hospitality. So, you know, this is just how we all keep helping each other out and doing these things. Uh, this is what a typical cabin will look like. Actually, there's a little atypical and that is two story. Most of the time the owners build a single story cabin, but they're nicely outfitted. You can have a bug net if you want. The food is great. It's all designed for tourism. It's all safe, safe food, safe water. <clears throat> and, and so here's some real specific stories. So at Esperanza Verde, when they were selling that farm, when Lon and Richard were selling it to uh, Vivian and Andrew, but they didn't realize what the, the royal was happening. And uh, the farm was vacant for about six to eight months. And that was long enough. They killed all the coffee. So when they ended up getting the farm and moving in, they realized they had no coffee left. So about 20 acres of coffee was dead. It had been mostly one type that wasn't resistant. So Vivian learned about new kinds of coffee, replanted in different varieties, and then had to wait four years for it. To, it takes about four years to flower and produce fruit enough to be able to then have a quantity to sell. She also learned about regenerative ag techniques. And if you're not familiar with it, I encourage you to go online and read about this. This is a, a new wave of, of doing uh, farming and, and horticulture that is as uh, much gentler to the earth. And she was incorporating this into the coffee growth. And then with the coffee manager, they were trying to develop like a manual that they were gonna go around in the valley and teach the other farmers how to do this, get away from any chemical use. It was a pretty neat idea. And I mean, it's too bad that in 2018, everything, you know, drop, everything collapsed because she was just starting to do this in 2018. At Jaguar, they were trying to grow coffee in the forest to be shade coffee, bird-friendly coffee, and they couldn't do it. After a few years, the coffee kept dying. There was too much humidity, and this fungus kept growing, and, and they didn't want to use chemistry to kill the fungus. So what they decided was they had pastures on the property. So they took the forest and made it a bird reserve. They just left it intact, no more coffee. They put the coffee out in the pasture, got rid of the cattle, so now you have coffee in the sun. Now, most people will tell you sun coffee is bad coffee. But in fact, in this case, it's really good coffee because they're leaving the forest as a reserve. It's a certified wildlife reserve. So uh, it's like working with a land trust here. And so it's a, it's a formal document. It leaves it alone. And then the coffee in the sun is uh, not with chemistry. So it's, it's organic. So that's pretty cool stuff. They were organic. It's no longer certified organic because... They used to be organic and they had to use organic chicken manure, but the chicken farm moved to Costa Rica. So they, they didn't want to ship chicken manure all the way up the highway on a diesel truck uh, just to have organic manure. And so they were told they could no longer be organic, but they could be certified by Rainforest Alliance. So this is where these different, uh, the different ways of certifying people, they're getting credit for what they're doing there, you know, as opposed to digging them for what they're not doing. They're getting credit for what they are doing. One of the biggest challenges is the, is the market. <clears throat> there, there's two ways to grow coffee. One is that direct trade. You're outside the, the market, but you're also subject to other things that are out of your control. But the other is this international market. 
And coffee is bought and sold as a commodity and a financial instrument. In other words, sometimes uh, uh, it's not it's not the coffee that a person is buying. They're just buying the rights to the coffee. It's kind of a crazy concept, but about half the coffee that's bought and sold is really is not physically bought at first. It's simply bought by somebody speculating. They're hoping that the price they buy might be low, and then it goes up, and then they'll resell it. And then when they resell it, then it's going to go maybe to a roaster. But a lot of the coffee, st- a lot of coffee activity on the market is just because of finance. That's pretty hard for, you know, a farmer doesn't know, a farmer in Nicaragua has no idea and, and certainly has no control. So there are things that are bought in the future, contracts, futures contract, contracts with a direct trade person. The small farmers form co-ops so that they have more clout. Uh, and also there's the importer-exporter deals with larger volume. An international group sets a base price. And the problem with this is that um, all types of coffee are included. So whether it's low grade coffee or high grade coffee uh, and the high grade is more expensive to produce it's subject to this price setting so it's a little bit tricky uh, prices fluctuate all over here's a six month period in 2014 where this is the high price of the high quality some what people were paying for some high quality coffee and it just kept going down even though nothing was really changing it was just because of speculation on the market so it fluctuates a bit um, other things that fluctuate might be the climate climate changes happening, labor supply, you can have too sh- uh, not enough people when you need them. Uh, when it's time to harvest, it's time to harvest. And so um, you got to harvest and sell. And you, you know, you might not get the price you thought you were going to get. So it's a pretty difficult business. In 2018, I think it was, the price of coffee dropped, all coffee dropped down to a dollar a pound, a dollar a pound is what they were paying people in Nicaragua, which is completely unsustainable. So To get sustainable coffee, costs. When people are agreeing to pay a fair trade price and they agree to pay uh, all the other costs associated for good coffee, this is from Hawar, it costs about $9 a pound just to get the coffee into the United States. That's before the roaster does anything. So that doesn't include the roaster wages. So if if you want to pay for sustainable coffee, you're going to have to pay at least $10 a pound. But normally, you're going to pay more like $15, right? Because once the roaster has to incorporate their, his, and the, his or her wages and the staff wages, then it's going to be a lot more. That's why sustainable or high-grade coffee is so expensive. So looking at what we do to try to help the community is what we call what I call social services. Again, helping people, helping nature. These are the two guys that I worked mostly with for the last 15 years at Esperanza Verde to be nature guys, to learn English, to take tour, to take tourists out. I got started with my colleague, John Connors, who used to work at the museum. He was helping Lana and Richard set the trails 20 years ago, and then he got me involved. And again, because I speak Spanish, I could teach these guys English, but I could just teach them how to be a nature guide in Spanish and then, and then later learn some of the English. But they got paid to be tour guides as part of their job. And it was a pretty nice gig because they also got a lot of good tips out of it. And then again, I brought these two gals down, these two sisters down to teach these women English because I never had time to work with them. And they had tried to do some English uh, classes in the evenings years ago, but they said they were just too tired. They have a very long day. They're cleaning cabins, they're cooking meals, and they're they're checking people in. It's it's they're 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 up at dawn and they don't get to bed till after sunset. It's a long day. They couldn't be learning English in the evening. They were just too tired. So what we did was these gals were out doing other work on the farm and they had a radio. And we just said, when you're ready, when you have a break in the action during the day, you just call them. And they would come back and spend 20 or 30 minutes in the lodge just doing conversational English. And they had a lot more fun that way and they learned a lot more that way. So it worked out to be a great thing for them. And so those are the, the things they did were ESL, English as a Second Language. I had them map, map the property and do some educational booklets for the birds that visit the bird feeders because the farm had set up bird feeder. That was a big, uh, that was a big draw for people coming to the farm is to see the wildlife, especially the birds at the feeder. And so here's Lily's book. I just want to mention she just became the expert on Nicaragua birds, and this is her field guide just published a few years, three years ago. It's in English and Spanish. It's the, fir- the first real field guide to the birds in Nicaragua. And then our little booklet was, there are 20 birds that come to the feeder and 10 hummingbirds that come to the hummingbird feeder, different feeders. So we, you know, I have photos of all these. And so we just put them in little uh, a front page and a back page. The idea was the species on the front, some photos, an arranged map, 
English and Spanish, and then a common name in English and Spanish. And then on the flip side were some fun facts, both in English and Spanish. And we got it done and had a review draft, and I took it back in 2018 when there were a couple of groups that came through in 2018. I got some really great comments. People loved it because they could quickly identify any of those 20 birds that were coming to the feeder. This book has a, has pictures of 800 species of birds, so you didn't uh, you only needed the 20 or 30 that were coming, and we had them in our little booklet, and it's just a shame that everything collapsed. But the idea was good, and it was a great project for Olivia and Vanessa to work on. So then the other thing we do with our, with our tour groups is, is get them involved with the locals, get them interacting, and the best way to do it is over food. So here are two sisters who live in San Ramon, and they made a dish called the Nakatama, which is a national dish in Nicaragua, and they would sell these to local restaurants. So we would pay the women, part of the tour was to pay them to show our students and let our students all just follow along and make their own nakatamal. And then we'd have nakatamales afterwards and have a fun dinner and interact with them. And if they wanted to practice their Spanish with, the students wanted to practice their Spanish with them, they could. Another way to do it was with tortillas. You'd be surprised at how hard it is the first few times to make a good tortilla. And it was always a lot of fun to get the students in the kitchen with the chef. And uh, again, they could practice their Spanish with the chef or um, just learn by a hand motion and everybody had a good time. And then the money that we generated from the tourism and the coffee sales would go to support some local things like this dance troupe for these young girls in town, or we would pay to have them transported up to the farm to learn about the wildlife and to have, we pay for their lunch uh, here I am showing them a bird and let them hold the bird and release the bird. So it was always a, it's always, uh, this was part of being what we considered sustainable, feeding, feeding some funds back into the local community. But the coffee was a big part of it, the coffee sale. The other thing uh, we worked with were a local group, this co these women formed a jewelry co-op. About 10 years ago, they'd been displaced, I guess it was 10 years ago, by Hurricane Mitch. And a, a lot big lands, a lot of landslides happened, and these women lost all their housing and property. They were they were put up near San Ramon, but it was a loan, it was a government loan, and they had to repay it. So the way they were doing this was to go collect seeds and get their kids to collect native seeds and make jewelry. So we brought our groups to buy from them, but also another fun way to interact with them. I would bring some home and sell it, uh, and then send the money back to them. So here is a collection of some of the seeds they would pick and they would get the kids too involved go around and pick them up off the ground or maybe off the bushes here's a a little display with their local names and the cool thing was my last time down when i was talking to them and i, I went to get some stuff from them and bring back and uh, we were talking about they wanted to do a reforestation project this is exactly the sort of thing you hope people will come to the realization that they looked around town and they're like we have all these empty lots it's just weeds Nobody's doing anything, no farming, no nothing, but we could grow the trees and the shrubs that produce these seeds, and we know it provides habitat for the wildlife, but it also will provide the seeds for our job, and so we were just about to get started on that when everything fell apart, but you know, you hope that uh, someday we'll get back to that sort of thing. That's exactly the kind of thing we'd like to see them doing locally. So here's some of the stuff they would make. It was really, really fun stuff. And then another activity. So now, you know, we said, well, what about having students do their own? They said, oh, yeah, we love doing that. So we would bring students. Our last trip down, our last year in 2018 with our last tour, we were able to set up a little jewelry making session with them just to let the students pick their own seeds and design their own and thread it however they wanted to thread them. And then, you know, the women just showed them how to do it and help them tie the knot and away you go. Again, a fun way to practice Spanish with the women and, um, just have interaction with them and support their local cause. And then the last thing these gals worked on was the mapping. So believe it or not, the owners did not have copies of a digital map. They had some paper maps, but they didn't have digital. Luis here is the coffee manager, and he's really good with Excel and good with computers, but he didn't have the technology for the mapping. And all these guys, this is our guard. This guy kept guard of the property, and there's Omar again. They just were very interested in wildlife conservation from all of our efforts. But uh, Olivia and Vanessa went around with GPS units and mapped the property, and then we taught Louise how to do it and gave him the software. I bought the software and a GPS unit for him. But there's their map, their trail map, and all the things they were 
plotting on the map so Louise would know exactly where it was in relation to the thing. And he can plot this on Google Earth, for example, and do stuff. And then this was the map he had made by himself with colored pencils. These are his coffee plots, and these were the forests they leave intact for uh, wildlife. So again, getting some technology over to the coffee managers, helping him and is helping the wildlife because they are very interested in the wildlife. So we'll go to the the the, the bird story. Um, this is one bird that uh, that I'll start with just as an example. It's a migratory bird, but it depends on clean water. And it, it goes between the U.S. and southern Canada and migrates to Central or South America. A lot of them go to Central America. And the point here is that we caught this bird in 2006, right, when I started going. And then I, we caught it in 08, 10, 11, and 12. And it was always in the same net, which I had strung over a stream right by the wet mill, right on the, on the farm I was working. The same little bird, little warbler, and it probably went back to the same spot in the U.S. or Canada where it nested. And, but it's tied to this little patch of stream year after year after year after year. And so it's an, a, it's an amazing thing to see this one little 20-gram, 18-gram bird flying back and forth between uh, these countries doing what it does. So... So that's the sort of stuff we're trying to study more and more. And there are two ways we, we've been doing it in Nicaragua. One is to look at some local movements, so how they use the space on the farm. We can tag and track birds and plot it on a map so we get their home range, what we consider their home range. Then the other is migration. So we have new technologies for doing that, and we have new ways to analyze it with the geographic information system and, and other tools on the computer. So the first thing we do is catch a bird. Most of the time we catch them in these soft nets. We can lure them in sometimes with the song or just put the nets up, we catch them, remove them. And uh, one way then to track their local movement is put these little radio transmitters on. So here we are putting a transmitter on a small songbird. These weigh a half a gram or less to, to work with these small birds. So we're getting local on-site movements with this technology. What This uh, transmitter has a frequency programmed into it. It's one frequency, so like your radio. So we just uh, trim the thread it's tied on that, that harness is tied on around the bird. We trim the thread, cover up the, then cover the feathers up. And so it's hidden under the feathers and just the antenna sticks out. And they go off and fly around and do what they do. Then we go out with our antennas and our receiver, dial in the frequency and track the bird and get points on where it occurs and maybe something about its behavior and put all the GPS points into the computer. And then we can understand how the bird is living on the landscape. And then we can use technology to understand how the birds are living across large landscapes. So, for example, how are they migrating or what about the birds in Nicaragua? Where do they go in the summer, the migrant birds? So we want to have con understand the connectivity at, at both ends of the spectrum. And for that, we have a couple of devices we can use. One is called Geolocator. They're relatively inexpensive. They do long-range movements. Their accuracy is, is low to moderate. GPS tags are expensive, but they're very precise. Um, the problem is they're heavy. They have to be on birds that are as big as a bluebird or larger. Um, the birds I study are smaller than bluebirds, so I have to use uh, a geolocator. And uh, I'm going to show you some work we did by putting these little devices that are less than a half a gram on the little warbler. <clears throat> and we're doing this because, again, birds are migrating. So here's a typical songbird, U.S. and Canada. A lot of songbirds have this breeding range, and then they migrate somewhere between Mexico and Northern South America. And so we're just trying to fill in the gaps of who's going where. And, you know, again, tying back to coffee, the reason for this is that the, the coffee in the shade is in a forest, but the forest is disturbed. It's reduced disturbance, but there are different ways to be bird friendly. In other words, there are different levels of disturbance. And we're just trying to understand what that might mean to some of these birds. And one in particular was the golden winged warbler, because this bird has been declining a lot the last 20 years, the, the numbers have been declining quite a bit. So this is a male on the left, a female on the right. And, and we noticed that we were finding them in the coffee farms when we'd go down on our tours. So we became part of a consortium of folks doing studies in different, in different states in the U.S. and also different countries. So this is the range map of the Golden Wing. They breed from Canada down to northern Georgia. They're in western North Carolina. They, as I said, they've been numbers have been dropping quite a lot, and they winter in Central and South America. And we just didn't know much about them, especially on their wintering grounds. One of the things we do know that they do, one interesting little tidbit, is they change their foraging behavior. In the spring and summer, they feed on live leaves where they're eating caterpillars and feeding their young caterpillars. But for some reason, 
in the winter, they switch and they only feed on things that are found in these dead suspended leaves. So you saw that female in that early photograph and she was clinging upside down, looking at a dead leaf. She was looking for the arthropod that are hidden inside these curled leaves. And that's what they do almost exclusively when they're in, for example, in Nicaragua, when we watch them 90% of the time, that's, that's where they're feeding. So it's a very different, a real big behavioral switch. Um, what it meant was they, uh, they seem to be defending those territories. There aren't, look, there aren't as many dead leaves here as there are live leaves. So with less resource, they seem, they seem to be defensive, which meant we could go down with a model, play the song. We put up uh, these fine nets, as I showed you earlier, and lo and behold, we catch a bird. And here's my graduate student. She's just caught one, and she's putting one of those transmitters on this bird that she'll be tracking. And um, so that's how we did what we did. And we did it at these two places. So Sharon and I worked at Finca Esperanza Verde at Apat Hawar. We did radio telemetry. We did some geolocator work. And I had help from call. Uh, collaborators with right here in Audubon, North Carolina. So my colleague Curtis Mullin has been working on golden wings in the mountains here for years, and uh, he's been helping folks with work, their bird work at Hawar. And when we were doing this golden wing work, uh, he sent down some transmitters for Sharna to use. And then when we were doing the geolocator work, he sent his assistant Amy. Here, this is Amy Tomcho. She's down helping me put the geolocators on a dozen birds that we caught. So it's always great to collaborate with folks. <clears throat> so this is Sharna's uh, data from her eight birds up at Hawar. This is just how it looks individually, and she mapped it on their property. And you can uh, you can see how it plays out. And it, so you see that they are separate. The males are separate. The overlap here is she caught a female. And this female, uh, almost exactly the range of that male, it makes you wonder if they were a mated pair even in the winter. We don't know. That's one of those social things. We don't know. But that's a fascinating thought. Uh, it's the only female we've ever we've ever tracked and uh, ever tagged and tracked. But the males do stay apart, and they're using about ten acres. That's actually pretty big for a bird in the winter. Um, I would say most of the songbirds probably only use two to three acres. Uh, birds that are not territorial because they overlap a lot. A lot of times you'll find two or three males in a mixed flock down there sharing the space, but not the golden ones. They don't share. <laughs> Uh, we took a closer uh, we took a closer look because we could see, you could see that here's some open space, those pastures, and maybe that's where the coffee is. And then here's the edge of the forest, and yet here's a bird in the forest. So I said, take, take a closer look. So she did, and most of the birds showed this pattern were about half the time the green is there on the edge, and the red about half the time they were in the forest. This is a bird that's considered uh, more of on the edge. And we didn't realize that they spent so much time in the forest until we had these old radio transmitters on and followed them into the forest and realized, oh, that's where they go. And Curtis found the same thing in North Carolina. They, they thought they were always on the edge, but when they put little transmitters on the birds up in the mountains where they breed, they found that, indeed, the males were going into the forest about half the time. So that's the kind of information that we get back to the property owners. So here we went to Jaguar. We tagged another half dozen birds. Here's two of them, uh, a male here and a male here. These are two different coffee plots. This is our trail going through the coffee. Uh, at, but these two males are happily living in the canopy, which is above the coffee bushes. And they were using similar space, about seven to 10 acres. Uh, the different coffee plots had different kinds of trees, but they, were, they still had golden wing warblers in them. And so the good news was that we had about 20 different male warblers across the 200 acres of um, of the farm and a lot of it had this coffee in the shade and the birds were happily using the different kinds of trees. So that's good news for the golden wings and for growing coffee in the shade. Um, we did work with that group to uh, get the geolocator data. The student in charge got geolocator data from birds in Honduras, two sites in Nicaragua, one in Costa Rica, and all of them ended up, she did the data analysis. Like I said, it's not exactly precise, but she was able to show that they were all breeding in the upper Midwest. All the birds went to either to either Wisconsin, somewhere in Wisconsin or Minnesota. So that's pretty neat. Now we have this connection. We put the two ends, uh, we put a line between the two ends. We know where they breed and we know where they winter. So Central America and the upper Midwest, that's a, they're pen pals. So this is the kind of data we share with all those landowners in Nicaragua. We work with them and it's helping them to manage the farms, helping the wildlife and the people. And we're just going to end up with a few pretty pictures because uh, these are some of the birds that we see. These are some of the hummingbirds. Just a couple here. 
This is a big one. You can see by the size of my hand. We see uh, half a dozen or more species of parrots, a little parakeet. Everybody loves a toucan, toucan Sam, if you like Fruit Loops. It comes to Nicaragua, it's come to Central America. There's a smaller toucan called a toucanet. This name may have changed now. I think they've decided there's some different species to this one, what was one species, but I, uh, we called it the emerald toucanet before. A couple those of are, uh, tropical birds, yeah? Yeah, those are amazing pictures. Such beautiful birds. I was just wondering, uh, some of those birds, would they actually eat the berries, the, the, the coffee uh, berries? They, uh, no, that's a good question. And in general, they do not. Um, there's one bird that might, and I'll show you in just a second. George mm -hmm. told me that there was only one bird he ever saw eating the coffee. Otherwise, they don't. They just eat the bugs that might show up on the coffee. <laughs> but they don't eat the coffee. Yeah, because then you imagine uh, what it might do to the bird, right? <laughs> like the caffeine, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, a trogon, a mop mot, um, beautiful iridescence. They have some big woodpeckers and small woodpeckers. This one looks like our pileated, and this one is in the same genus as the ivory build. Uh, now extinct here, but called pale build. There's a small bird group of birds called mannequins. If you have not seen mannequins online doing their courtship dance. I encourage you to do it. It's pretty comical. They do some pretty interesting gymnastics to attract a mate, and some people have put it to music. So look it up online. It's um, pretty entertaining. There are a large group called Fie Catchers. This is perhaps the most uh, dramatic looking one. This is a male on the left and a female on the right of Royal Fie Catcher. This is the bird that might eat coffee. George said sometimes they'll eat the fruit, the jay. <clears throat> they have several kinds of jays in the area, and this one is bushy crested jay only occurs from Guatemala to northern Nicaragua, so it's a real restricted range, but they, they happily occur along the fringes of the coffee plantations, even in the coffee. They'll nest in the coffee bushes. Tanagers are a group, a large group of tropical birds. They're very colorful. These are more of a blue-tinged. Then some are more black and red. Uh, this one now I think is called scarlet rump tanager. They split it back into two species. That's great. I like scarlet rump for a name. Uh, one tanager, this one is just amazing. There are there's a dozen of them that, that have this sort of pattern. I never thought a bird like this would blend in until one day I was looking up and saw this bird. The, the, the forest was actually kind of dark. I had to open the camera lens to be able to get the photo, and it washed out the sky. But that sky was blue. And so this blue blended in the blue, the green blended in the green, and I realized that bird really does blend in from, from below. It was pretty amazing, but in the hand, it really stands yeah. out. It, it's, these they are big awesome. thousands. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm so sorry, uh, John. Uh, these are just beautiful birds. Uh, but unfortunately, we are at the end of our program. And I just love the stories and, you know, the relationship between the people and the and the students and, and what you have accomplished there. It's, it's just amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And meanwhile, you guys can sure. look at all the other wildlife that John is, is putting up. But we would love to thank you all for being with us. And thank you, John, again, for this wonderful talk. Um, we do want to thank also our sponsors, the North Carolina Science Festival and Biogen Foundation. And also, we want to extend our thank you to our Friends of the Museum members who support us every single day and who make events like this possible. So um, there are lots of other programs uh, for the rest of the week. So please check out our website. I believe we're going to put a link to those uh, other programs in our chat as well. And um, other than that, if you want to watch it again, you can because we are going to record this and uh, you can see it on our SciTech website. So, and thank you so much for keep on showing all those beautiful pictures, John. That's, that's amazing. Thank you so much. Sure is the last one. And if, you know, if people have uh, other questions, uh, my email is on the museum's uh, website, but it's john.gurwin at naturalsciences.org. And you can send me any questions I can always answer or do another uh, video chat with somebody if you have some more questions that we didn't get to. That would be wonderful. Yeah, and we can put maybe your email in the chat as well. That sounds great. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, John. And I hope to see you guys next time.
Have a good day. Bye-bye.